Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm the Chief Executive of the RSA. I'm delighted to welcome you here for today's uh, event. Could you uh, make sure your mobile phone is switched to uh, silent? We're live streaming today's event, so welcome to our web viewers. And if they or if you want to join the online conversation, the hashtag for today's event is RSA Assisted Dying. Uh, now, that's uh, uh, obviously the topic for today's uh, conversation, assisted dying. Um, it's a question many of us hope never to have to face. Uh, what is the most humane response to a loved one in extreme suffering and incapacitation who wishes to end uh, their life? Lord Faulkner's bill on assisted dying is due to have its crucial second reading in the House of Lords this summer. And there is, of course, huge public interest in the legislation uh, debate. Uh, so our question today, should there be a change in the law to permit physicians and others to assist death uh, for those who are uh, terminally ill, but mentally competent, and who have, sent, set, who have expressed a settled wish to uh, die. To help us tackle this, we have three expert commentators. Uh, an old friend uh, of the RSA, Professor Raymond Tallis, philosopher, poet, novelist, cultural critic, um, often criticised me in public, but we're still friends. Aren't we? yeah. uh, uh, until recently, a physician and clinical scientist. His national roles have included consultant advisor in healthcare of the elderly to the chief medical officer and chairmanship of the Royal College of Physicians Committee on Ethics in Medicine. Uh, in July 2011, he was elected chair of health, of, uh, healthcare professionals for assisted uh, dying. Dr. Kevin Yule is, uh, have I pronounced that right, Kevin? Yes. Great. Uh, is senior lecturer in American history in the Faculty of Education and History at the University of Sunderland. His research and teaching interests are broad and in interdisciplinary. M much of his work centers on the history of the United States in the 20th and late 19th century. And he, uh, and, and he sits on the Research Beacon Committee for the Faculty of Education and Society. He is the author of, and this is of course why he's here, Assisted Suicide, the Liberal Humanist Case Against Legalization. Leslie Close is a patron of Dignity in Dying, an editor of Assisted Dying, who makes the final decision, the case for greater choice at the end of life. Her brother, John Close, died with help from Dignitas in May 2003, aged 55. So the way it's going to work is that Ray's going to speak for 10 minutes. Kevin is going to respond for 10 minutes, um, or, or make the alternative case, and then Leslie is going to speak for about eight minutes, I think, uh, having listened to their two contributions, then we'll open it up to conversation from the floor. So can I ask you first of all to welcome Ray Tallis. Matthew, thank you very much indeed for that nice introduction. Thank you for your hospitality. And Marie, thank you also for organizing today. And as you can see, we have a particular issue, which is the question of a sister dying. And one of the triggers for today's meeting is the book that um, Matthew referred to that Leslie and Leslie Close and Joe Cartwright have edited, A Sister Dying Who Makes the Final Decision. So let me just very briefly talk about the case for changing the law. And let me just make sure if I press the knob the right thing happens. As Matthew mentioned, the, uh, there is an assisted dying bill currently going through the House of Lords, which is probably going to have its second reading later this year, probably in the summer. So what we're talking about is not just theoretical, it is something that is highly topical. And Matthew made very clear what we're talking about. Assisted dying relates to when somebody who's terminally ill, mentally competent, adult, is making the choice of their own free will, and after meeting strict legal safeguards to take prescribed medicine which will end their life. Medicine usually prescribed by a medic. And this is not possible at the moment. And in fact, assisting someone to die may actually lead to a charge of manslaughter which carries a jail sentence of 14 years. We're not talking about assisted suicide more broadly. When chronically ill or disabled people who are not terminally ill can be given help to end their lives. Nor are we talking about voluntary euthanasia when terminally ill adults or sometimes chronically ill or disabled adults can have their lives ended by a doctor. In assisted dying, the last act is by the patient, although there is assistance from the clinician. I'm going to briefly touch on the case four, which is very easy, and then I'm going to touch slightly less briefly on the case against, and show how much of the case against is founded on misunderstanding. The case four is straightforward. Needless suffering at the end of life, it seems to me that the patient uh, wishes to escape from, the patient cannot withstand is something that I as a physician feel I ought to be able to help about help and it seems to me that compassion requires that we should respect the wishes of people who, who whose life 
is very near its end, whose symptoms are not responding to palliative care, that we should respond to their wish for assistance. And responding to the wish also respects something that is central for me to the practice of medicine, which is to respect patients' choices. Nobody else's views uh, should override what a patient wants. And the third issue is, in fact, that of safety. Many of us feel at the moment the situation is so confused that actually it's rather unsafe. Those are the three reasons why we should need, have a change of the law along the lines that uh, Lord Faulkner is proposing. But many people are opposed to a change in the law and they support their arguments with not facts, but what one might politely call factoids. There's the claim that if we had assisted dying as an option, then this would stunt or reverse the development of palliative care. And we know that in many places, palliative care is still not uh, optimal. Well, the evidence from international experience is that liberalization of the law in this area does not stunt and in fact promotes the development of palliative care. There's also the claim that it would break down trust between doctors and patients and doctors and society. There is no evidence, again, from international experience uh, that this happens. In fact, the evidence is in the opposite direction. That it would lead to devaluation of human life, particularly of people with disabilities. There is no evidence from that. If we look very closely at Oregon, where they have a law not too dissimilar to the law that Lord Faulkner is proposing, the, this is not at all the case. In the Netherlands, which is, uh, whose laws go much further than any of us in healthcare professionals for assisted dying or dignity in dying would wish, in fact, there is no evidence that people with disability are treated badly. In fact, I have been very impressed as a geriatrician of the care of people with disability in, in the Netherlands. Hojwe, uh, the dementia village, is an absolute beacon of humane and respectful care for people with dementia. There's the idea that if we have assisted dying for people who are terminally ill, it will be extended to people who aren't dying. UK will mysteriously turn into Belgium. Assisted dying will never to be extended to people who aren't dying and don't wish to die and cannot express their wishes. Assisted dying will eventually become an obligation. I'm now 67, so I will have to offer myself up uh, for you know, metaphysical rebadging. And all of this is happening somewhere or other. That is not the case. If you take Oregon, which is a very good comparator, the proportions of death that are assisted, first of all, numerically, haven't risen significantly. They're not risen above 0.25% in the decade and a half since the Death with Dignity Act was enacted. And that would be the equivalent of 1,000 people or 1,200 people out of the roughly half a million deaths a year in the UK. But more importantly for the argument, slippery slope argument, is there's been no extension of indications for assistance beyond assisted dying for terminally ill, nor is there any evidence of a public appetite for this. So the slippery slope is just a uh, fantasy. I was once told, did you, do you know that the number of people receiving assisted dying uh, in Oregon had increased fourfold in the first few years? That was true. It had increased from a rather small number, 16, to a pretty small number, 71, as the law was bedded in. What about the idea that people will seek assistance to die because other people want them to die? Well, what are the reasons, the frequent reasons for seeking assisted dying in Oregon? Losing autonomy, the feeling you've lost control, the desire to regain control, the inability to engage in activities making life enjoyable, and loss of dignity. All of those are things that are centered on the person who is seeking assisted dying. It's very interesting that uh, spokespeople for particular groups are at odds with those for whom they speak. Religious leaders are pretty universally opposed to assisted dying, but their flocks are actually and the vast majority in support of assisted dying, on average about 75% support with people with religious beliefs. The spokespeople for people with disabilities say that we don't want assisted dying, it will devalue people with disabilities. Actually, if you survey, as has been done recently, people with disabilities, 71% support assisted dying because it's part of what people with disabilities want, which is a choice and their choices to be respected. You may have heard that doctors are opposed to assisted dying, and indeed their representative bodies, or unrepresentative bodies, such as the BMA and the Royal College of Physicians, have a stance of opposition. 
the Royal College of General Practitioners is currently reviewing its position. Um, but if you look at general practitioners, for example, a recent study found that um, about a third supported a change of the law in favor, or felt that their college should support a change in the law. A third said their college, or more than a third, said their college should have a neutral stance. And only a third were comfortable with their, current, their college's current stance of opposition to assisted dying. What about mistakes? If you assist someone to die, clearly it's not something you can reverse. Well, we're dealing with people with well-characterized illness, very advanced disease, and remember doctors on the whole tend to be a rather optimistic crowd and they tend to overestimate prognoses rather than underestimate them. What is more, in Lord Faulkner's bill, there's the opportunity of a pause for reflection. 14 days. If you decide that you wish to have a sister dying and you do all the uh, appropriate processes in order to ensure that, there is a pause for reflection for 14 days. So it's not as if somebody who has fluctuating feelings uh, is going to, as it were, uh, at a time when they're feeling low, be, um, agree to something they don't ultimately want. And by the way, if you have a sister dying, that will prompt a review of the case. There are less chances of mistakes than there are at the moment. A request for assisted dying would prompt a review of the diagnosis. Have we got it right? Are we right about the prognosis? Is this person having adequate palliative care? And one of the most interesting statistics from Oregon is that only a minority of those who actually discuss assisted dying with their doctors actually get a prescription. And of those who get a prescription, only half actually use it. So you can see there's plenty of time for reflection. It's not as if you boarded a train you can't get off, quite unlike the situation when you're journeying uh, to um, Zurich, uh, which is uh, the, one of the current alternatives, grim pilgrimages abroad. What are the alternatives at the moment? Amateur assistance, botched and assisted suicide, trips to dignitas, or post hoc decisions by the Director of Public Prosecutions deciding whether or not the assistant, person who assisted the individual to die was acting out of compassion or out of criminal malice. At the moment, life-shortening decisions, withholding or stopping uh, treatments, starvation and dehydration are carried out in a situation of clinical, ethical and legal fudge. Hence a lot of hoo-ha, unfair in my opinion, a lot of hoo-ha about the livable care pathway. Some people think the law is good enough as it is. The law, I believe, is an absolute and total shambles, and it has many problems, which I'm sure we'll discuss. Some people think that universal excellent palliative care would make assisted dying unnecessary. I've already jumped with that in general, but I want to allude to one particular example. Incidentally, Baroness Finlay of Landaff, a very authoritative voice in this area, has agreed that palliative care isn't a blanket panacea. But my predecessor, as the chair of healthcare professionals for assisted dying, a brilliant, visionary, compassionate and bitter doctor, Anne McPherson, had the most horrendous death. There she was. She was in Oxford where they have world-class palliative care. But as her daughter described in a brilliant article in the BMJ, a very harrowing article a couple of years ago, my mum wanted a sister to die and we watched her die slowly and in pain. And the article is an extremely harrowing read. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've made the case, the many cases for a change in the law to decriminalize the involvement of physicians and clinicians in assisting terminally ill people who have a settled wish to die, who are mentally competent, to have their wish respected. Thank you. Uh, so, Kevin, Ray claims to have already defeated all the arguments we're going to hear from you. So uh, uh, it's a challenge for you, but uh, uh, please welcome Kevin Yule. I shall remain sitting, if that's okay with everybody else. Um, I recognize that most people will, be, uh, will oppose my particular position. I think a majority, uh, I think we can all agree and all admit that a majority of people in this country uh, support legalization of assisted suicide. Uh, but I want to throw a few questions in and, and really throw a, th a spanner in the works, so to speak, and try and get you to think uh, about what exactly is happening. First of all, a note about me. Uh, like Ray, I'm, I'm an atheist. I come from a different perspective than a lot of people who oppose assisted suicide. I'm an atheist. I have no religious agenda. Uh, most of my positions would be recognized as liberal, 
I oppose capital punishment, and I'm also a strong believer in abortion rights for women. Um, I favor social freedoms and consider myself a libertarian in general. Um, so, first of and another note that I think is necessary to make, I oppose legalization of assisted suicide and or euthanasia, not the actions of individuals uh, in extremely difficult circumstances. Um, difficult cases do not make good law, in my experience. I agree that there are, and there are likely to be, a very few cases if it's legalized. I agree with Ray's point there. I do think uh, the number of cases is, is likely to be small. Uh, but it does make me wonder why we need legalization if there are so few uh, cases, and given that nobody is languishing in prison at this very moment for having assisted a suicide or for uh, uh, having done a genuine mercy killing. I think we can trust juries and even police are, are generally sensitive to the difficulties inherent in these situations. But I want to convince you of one point, really, which is that it is dangerous to cross uh, the Rubicon whereby we legalize uh, the taking of life simply because it is wretched. And uh, Ray mocked the, the whole issue of Belgium, but I think Belgium is a very, very good example of what can occur and it, what is very likely to occur as well. I think Belgium is a much better example than is Oregon. Um, and what I want to point to is the permeable nature of the cutoff point of terminally ill. There's a big distinction made between the terminally ill with six months or less uh, left to live and other people. And I want to really try and question that because it doesn't seem to me uh, supported or justifiable in any moral sense or in any ethical sense. Uh, it had, I, I can't really tell the difference um, uh, between the, the uh, six months to live and 12 months to live. Uh, it seems to be a very permeable kind of uh, cutoff point and not really justifiable. And that's precisely what's happened in Belgium um, from what I can see. Um, so th the difference uh, which is significant for those considering either Scottish Parliament's assisted suicide bill or Lord Falconer's assisted dying bill that, that uh, Ray mentioned um, is that in Oregon, which is the basis of the, of the uh, English legislation, uh, campaigners focus only upon spreading limited legislation to the 46 states where it is not legal. Um, they have yet to convince the majority of Americans uh, that suic assisted suicide is a very good idea. So the equivalent here would be, for instance, legalizing assisted suicide in Rutland and no place else. It would not change the culture, and it hasn't changed the culture in uh, the United States. But Belgium and Netherlands indicate uh, what happens when the principle is accepted, when the Rubicon is crossed. And let's look at the campaigners. Uh, one of the interesting things I find is that the, the idea that as soon as this law is passed, that all campaigners will dust down their hands um, and uh, go home and say, job well done. And this certainly isn't the case in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Um, where in Belgium and in the Netherlands, there's been, for instance, a campaign, and, and Ray alluded to this uh, rather mockingly, uh, but there has been a campaign signed by 130,000 uh, people, the, the particular petition, and uh, to extend the benefits of voluntary death to all those over 70 who are tired of life. Uh, and this is what the campaigners are, are moving on to do. In Belgium, a, a very few moral entrepreneurs have extended a euthanasia to two 45-year-old twins who were going blind, and to a 43-year-old transsexual who did not like the results of his surgery. Um, this is what is occurring. The lines, this, this sort of uh, holy cutoff point of six months to live with a terminally ill, a terminal illness uh, is, being, uh, is being extended constantly in Belgium and Holland. Uh, no one in Belgium, for instance, batted an eyelid when, uh, when we heard last week that euthanasia has been extended to children of any age. And this is because the principle of euthanasia has been accepted in the Belgian culture. So legalizing assisted suicide, one of the interesting things is I find it the justifications never quite marry up. So you have the justification of autonomy. Obviously, if you want autonomy and that you should provide people with assisted deaths uh, on the basis of autonomy, 
You can't turn anybody down who is requesting that. On the basis of autonomy, you need to help the 43-year-old transsexual who's not happy with uh, his surgery. You need to help a 22-year-old lovelorn person um, at that age. And you can't delineate between uh, that person and an 86-year-old person suffering from cancer. On the basis of autonomy, they should all have assisted deaths. Um, if you do not take that, and if you take that position, which I know quite a few people do, I'm not sure what your positions are, but I know a lot of people on that campaign for assisted uh, suicide, assisted dying, um, do support that position that anybody should have the right uh, to an assisted death. Uh, the majority that supports the legislation now suddenly evaporates. We have 15% of the British population supports an assisted suicide for anybody. The alternative to that is, of course, um, having this cutoff point and setting, separating off a group of people uh, and saying that their lives are more expendable than other people. Uh, if you allow suicide for a particular group and you define that group, you are saying everybody in that group has lives that are less equal than everybody else who we're going to dissuade from suicide. So the alternative to that is to say, um, we're only going to let you people uh, commit suicide because we agree that your lives are utterly worthless. And I think this is um, why disabled people tend to oppose assisted suicide. As, as uh, Ray alluded to, doctors uh, oppose assisted suicide as a majority, and disabled people in the polls that I've seen uh, also, uh, by less of a majority, but still a majority, oppose legalization of assisted suicide. And they rightly fear that the motivation behind assisted suicides is that they don't want to be dependent on others, that they, uh, some of the reasons that Ray left up on the board there, um, that they do not want to have that kind of situation, um, that they are, uh, where, you know, they don't, they don't want to, um, sorry, I'm getting lost there. Uh, they don't want to lead lives that many disabled people lead every day. And this is what frightens disabled people, is that there's these physical criteria by which we're saying, yes, your lives are totally expendable, and everybody else's lives aren't. So there's only those two positions that you can take, and uh, I'm not happy with either of them. Um, so in close, I would just say, I do think we should look to Belgium. Uh, I do think that that represents the future of assisted suicide in euthanasia, uh, and not Oregon. When the entire United States becomes, uh, uh, you know, it, it's passed in every single state, then we can talk about Oregon as, as actually representing something real. But until then, we need to look at places where the culture has changed, and uh, Belgium and the Netherlands are it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Kevin. And then finally, please welcome Leslie Close. Good afternoon. I too will remain seating, seated and I've got some pictures which, to give you something else to look at other than me. <laughs> Eleven years ago this month I was helping my brother John Close to prepare for his death. He was 55 and dying of motor neurone disease diagnosed two years earlier. After seeing the story of Reg Crew, the first Briton whose journey to Dignitas was publicised, John typed one finger at a time, that's how I'd like to go when my time comes. And my response was to confirm that his life was his to do with as he saw fit, and I would do everything I could to help him to achieve his goal of a peaceful and dignified death at the time of his choosing. That's why on the afternoon of Monday the 26th of May 2003, we were in a tiny flat in central Zurich. John was only the seventh British person to have Dignitas's help to die, so we had very little idea what to expect as that last day of John's life unfolded. Yes, John died on the day he arrived in Switzerland. That's changed now. And anyone seeking Dignitas's help must spend at least 48 hours there between meeting the doctor and taking the lethal medication they prescribe. And I'm very glad John didn't have to wait that long. He could no longer stand, walk, speak, or get into and out of bed by himself. He had to be hoisted between his wheelchair and his bed, and he used a slide board to transfer to his waterproof shower and lavatory chair. That last day of John's life, he laughed at a strange nude painting on the wall of the Dignitas flat. He smiled at the taste of plain chocolate on his tongue, but he couldn't swallow his chocolate-flavoured saliva for fear of choking. He had a peg feeding tube through the wall of his stomach, 
so that the liquid complete nourishment that kept him alive for the last seven months of his life could be delivered safely. I connected a feeding syringe full of lethal medication to that peg tube and John pressed the plunger. Just before he willingly ingested that barbiturate overdose, my brother gave me one last big lopsided smile. The drug sent him into a deep sleep and he died very peacefully about 20 minutes later. Yes, my brother was happy to be in Switzerland on that final day of his life, but he would have found spending two nights there very hard. It was very hard to accept that John was dying of MND, but both he and I gained comfort from knowing that he would be in control at the end of his life. With Dignitas' help, my dear brother obtained the peaceful and dignified death he sought, but it did not happen at the time of his choosing. That's because, as well as fitting in with Dignitas' plans, John had to travel to Switzerland while he still had sufficient bodily strength to take, undertake that journey. There was no question about his mental strength. John was a determined individual. When I started writing the personal stories, which form half of the book published by Peter Owen last week, I had only my brother's example to call on. What I learned by listening to bereaved relatives tell their stories is that everyone who has made, or who would have liked to make, that same journey was, like John, strong, determined, and courageous. No matter how ill they were, they were certain that dying well was better than living intolerably. Pamela Tucson told me about her mother, Efstratea. She made a difficult choice, one which is available to everyone, when she stopped eating and drinking in order to end her life. Efstratea died after just five days, and her doctor suggested that her strength of will had played a role in the speed with which her life ended in January 2009. When Colin Marriage was told in July 2012 that he could expect, only expect to live for one more week, he brought his wedding forward to the following day. A few days after that happy event, he was told that he could expect to live for another week, and he wept in dismay at having to endure so many more days. Despite the pain relief he was getting, even one intolerable day was too long. His sister Kelly is certain that he would have asked for an assisted death a few days after his wedding, had that choice been available to him. At the start of this millennium, Nigel Goodman was entering the phase of Huntington's disease which would render him helpless. Rather than endure the suffering he had seen his father go through, Nigel took an overdose of heroin with his mother Heather Pratton's help. They talked about his life for a while before they fall, fell asleep. When Heather awoke and her son was not quite dead, she smothered him with a pillow. Nigel had repeatedly written the same suicide note, I am suffering and I want to die. Liz Smith's mother was suffering a form of dementia which she had witnessed in her own mother. She did not want her life to end in a locked psychiatric ward, so she tried to commit suicide while she was still rational. Liz's father sat with her until she appeared to be in distress. She was admitted to hospital and died a few days later. A few years later, Liz's father developed terminal cancer and he too tried to commit suicide. Liz was with him and he was readmitted to the hospice where he died the following day. Both of Liz's parents suffered after their suicide attempts because they did not know what to take. Neil Love knew exactly what to take and when and how because he'd been a policeman nearly all his working life. He was dying of a brain cyst and his widow Lizzie found him dead one morning. He left a note which read, I love you darling, time to go while it's my choice. Not everyone whose story appears in the book would have qualified for an assisted death under Lord Falconer's bill but I'm sure they would all have been reassured by knowing that the choice existed. My brother would have lived for a few more weeks if he hadn't had to travel to Zurich, if he could have discussed the subject with his GP before asking for help to die. Interestingly, that man, Dr. Eric Rose, addressed a BMA conference in Scotland a few weeks after John died. He said that knowing John had altered his opinion about assisted dying, and he now felt the law should be changed. I feel very privileged to have been allowed to write the moving personal stories which appear in the book. Before I started writing, I thought I knew a lot about the subject of assisted dying, but I learned a huge amount from the people I, who told me those stories. And I also learned a great deal by editing the chapters which appear between my own. I've learned the importance of challenging people who say, say things like, in the Netherlands, people no longer trust their doctors, and there will be a slippery slope, and old people will be pressured into asking for an assisted death. Statements like that are simply intended to make the audience doubt the wisdom of changing the law. I will now ask the person making such an assertion for statistics to back it up. And unless and until someone shows me a better way to solve the UK's problem of intolerable suffering at the end of life, I will campaign to change the law to something like the Oregon model. 
Assisted dying works there, and Lord Falconer's bill contains even more safeguards than Oregon's legislation. Doctors in that state are not regarded as murdering monsters, and the rest of Oregon's medical and social care system works perfectly well. And Oregon has not yet been consumed by hellfire, which brings me to my last point. I have yet to hear a convincing fact-based argument against assisted dying, although I have heard many which are based purely on the dictates of a church. There is a growing trend for faith leaders to declare their support for assisted dying, and the majority of individuals who declare that they have faith in God also express their support for change in the law. Please note that's individuals rather than religious organisations. And the same is true of people with disabilities, the majority of whom are in favour of assisted dying, although their representative bodies may take a stand against it. I believe that the most convincing argument in favour of changing the law is the testimony of people who have endured terrible suffering as the end of their life approached, and the stories told by those who witnessed their bad deaths. There are hundreds of people alive today, people like Colin, Nigel, Estratea, Neil and John, who will suffer intolerably as they die over the next few days, weeks or even months. We should listen to their message while we can. As Sir Terry Pratchett said in his foreword to the book, in years to come, people will look back aghast at a time, this time, when people were forced to choose between living on and dying well. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And we, uh, we've got copies of... Uh, Leslie's uh, edited collection of uh, essays and also Kevin's book on assisted suicide available uh, outside at the end of the um, event. Um, can I just ask you one question, uh, Ray, before we open up? So I, I'm, I'm very taken by the point that uh, Kevin makes, that you made the principle of autonomy the centerpiece of your yeah. argument. And you also made implicitly the idea that we should move from a modelled situation to a position of clarity. But what's your response to Kevin's point, which is you're simply replacing one modelled position for another modelled position, because you'll be saying, well, people who have less than six months to live have this choice and have this autonomy, but people who've got six and a half months to live don't have this choice and don't have this yeah. autonomy. I think that's a really a good and central point. First of all, at the moment we've got three sources of muddle. We've got a clinical muddle, we've got a legal muddle, and we've got an ethical muddle. And without doubt, the kind of review of what's happening to someone towards the end of life when they are clearly, medicine is not helping them, uh, that would be triggered by the law if they seek assisted dying would actually disperse the clinical muddle and the legal muddle. Now, the ethical muddle is not you. It, it isn't really a muddle, but the ethical problem that Kevin has alluded to isn't unique to assisted dying. Let me give an example. We all support free speech. We all are very pleased that certain people end up in jail as a result of hate speech. But you and I would be hard put to say exactly the point in the continuum between free speech and hate speech at which one becomes another. So you can be a passionately support free speech and the extension of free speech to the point where actually it generates harm. And this is where a second principle kicks in, which is a harm principle. And my feeling is that what assisted dying law would be beneficent because it extends the autonomy for a certain group of people, but if you extended it further, then harm would become uh, a, a more, more in, in, in important problem. So I think that's the, the key thing. And of course, uh, that, as it were, difficulty that Kevin has raised, which I think is, a, is, is, is basically a difficulty of human life, not specific to this, applies also to the decision that medical care is futile. Somebody says, we ought to give up at this stage, it's futile. At what stage does medical care become futile? What about the double effect? You may be familiar with the double effect that essentially a, uh, it is appropriate for a physician to give a treatment that with the primary aim of, of controlling symptoms, but my, might have the secondary unintended consequence of shortening life. And the double effect is okay um, because of the primary aim. But actually, it has never been clear to me in medicine and in medical care at what point someone is moving from the double effect to actually a primary intention to hasten death. So there again, you've got a continuum at which you have to dichotomize. And dichotomizing across a continuum is something that's not peculiar to assisted dying. It's not peculiar 
to those of us who support assisted dying, it's a, it is present throughout end-of-life care, and indeed it's present throughout our decisions in, in civic society. Great. Okay, let's, let's open it up to questions. And can I just say this? Um, we, we've got plenty of time for, for conversation. What, what in, in keeping with the RSA spirit of debate, what I hope we're going to emerge from in 25 minutes is greater clarity about what it is we disagree about. So we, have a, we agree what we disagree about. What I don't think we're going to do today is resolve the issue. Um, so if we could express our comments in those ways, it would, be, uh, it would be useful. And what I'll do, I think, is I'll just take kind of five comments and then bring the panel back in. Don't feel the need to respond to every comment, but just uh, anything that you're particularly interested in. Um, let's start with the lady at the back of the room. And if you could give us your name, it will just help the panel respond to you. Hi, I'm Jan Williams. Um, I wanted to ask Kevin Ewell. Um, I listened carefully, um, and obviously time is limited on this panel. And I did have the feeling that most of his arguments did come under the headings of the slippery slope and the UK will become Belgium. And I just wondered if, given a couple more minutes, he would have any other arguments to add. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we'll take the gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Michel. I was formerly president of the RCVS, which regulates the professional conduct of veterinary surgeons. I've been responsible for the clinical care of pets, of farm animals, and of horses, and also of laboratory animals. I also nursed my wife through most of her terminal illness with pancreatic care, during which she experienced the highest levels of clinical care and palliative care, beyond any criticism that I could raise. But in her final weeks, her suffering was so great that twice she asked me to end her life, which but for the existence of our daughter, I would certainly have done and suffered the consequences. My question is simple and I've never heard a satisfactory answer yet. In a democracy where the wishes of the majority of the electorate, including those committed to a religious belief, are clearly in favour of a change in the law, why do we tolerate in human patients levels of suffering which if imposed on dogs, cats, horses, cattle, sheep, or laboratory animals would lead to disciplinary action, indeed to prosecution. Where is the religious or ethical argument to sustain that? It does not seem to me to be a way of valuing human life above animal life, which of course we all do. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's fine. I don't get too uptight about this, but I'm going to ask you to do me a favour, which is not to applaud people when they speak, however brilliant you think they're speaking. It's just because when people are applauded for what they say, the whole thing just starts to get a bit, you know, and let's just, you know, uh, which isn't to say it wasn't a great comment, but I just, if we can just, is that okay? Right, so gentlemen there. Hi, my name is Paul Cannon. Um, I really want to point a clarification um, to do with what the law is at the moment. You talked about primary intent. My understanding, and I think this is really, really important, is that if you are in pain, or if your relative is in pain, at the moment, your doctor, or the nurse, or whoever is there, is legally allowed to give additional pain control to treat that pain. So excellent palliative care can mean being pain-free, even if that shortens life. And that is absolutely fine. And provided your primary intent is to alleviate pain, that's legal. If your intent is to kill someone, that is illegal. And the, the, the point that you're looking at, which is where is the divide, is is the person in pain? At which point you can give more pain medication. Ray, do you want to respond to that specific point of clarification? Then if, if, if you two don't agree with Ray, then you can come in, but uh, yeah. I think the problem with your question is it focuses on pain. The vast majority of people in pain, you can actually control the pain, if necessary, by putting them into a continuous sedated state. You can reduce them essentially to an organism rather than a person by just keeping them sedated. The problem is not pain. The problem, I'm sure, with Bob Michel's question was utter and total disintegration, collapse, lack of control of anything, uh, not being able to speak, to eat, and so on and so forth. There is no tablet that can restore speech. There is no tablet that can enable you to eat. There is no tablet, and so on and so forth. And that's the situation where, uh, for a small number of people, but a very significant number of people, palliative care can do nothing. Pain isn't the issue. Okay. 
Okay. More. Good. That's good. Well, that's a well noted point. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, question, uh, Martin Dumont. Um, my partner died three years ago of pancreatic cancer, and uh, I'd sit and watched her uh, starve to death and uh, dehydrate while well, tapping a wet tissue on her lips. And the palliative care, I'm sure, was excellent, but fundamentally, I didn't see much dignity. Uh, but I saw an awful lot of dying, and I am left with the abiding memory of somebody who I loved and cared about who I didn't even recognise. And I think in some ways there are two sorts of victims in this situation. It's the person who dies, and it's the person who's left with the memory of having to go through that process and help them out. I'd like to ask a question of the doctor, which alludes to the previous thing, which is, <laughs> why is pain, relief, and care more valuable than actually just watching somebody starve? I mean, to say, if I took my cat and dog in the same situation to the vet, and he said, Martin, this is what we'll do, we'll morph them up, you know, basically, and then we'll sit and watch them die and starve to death, etc. Uh, and then, you know, the invoice is payable in 28 days. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think that's a particularly good enough idea. I mean, I don't understand this whole thing about why pain is the be-all and end-all, but we're quite prepared to see people starve to death and dehydrate. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, let's take these two uh, gentlemen here, and then we'll bring the panel back in to pick up on a couple of comments. Um, I, I'm sorry if I misunderstand some of the arguments, but it seems... Can you tell us your name, sorry? Uh, sorry, William Garnier. Um, the argument seems to be based upon unbearable suffering, and this goes beyond, obviously, simple pain that's been alluded. It's also to disintegration of your life, but also, um, for a while now, suffering has been kind of defined much more widely, apart from physical feelings, through to mental disorders, uh, severe depression, anxiety disorders. And currently, if you are suffering unbearably, and people do suffer unbearably, from these disorders, which aren't typically linked to physical symptoms, but to horrendous mental symptoms, which may lead them to wish to end their lives. The current policy initiative is to um, try and make them uh, stop them from committing suicide. And how does the argument of, how do you reconcile the two arguments of physical pain is uh, answerable with allowing suicide, but mental suffering is traditionally answered with um, no, that it's not a good enough reason to commit suicide and has always been discouraged. Yeah, so I think that's a really, I just, I, can I just clarify, because I think it's a very important point. So what I take from that is the point that, of course, anybody can decide to kill themselves. Mm. And often people who suffer very awful mental anguish will make that decision. But the point, I think, is that the, what we feel it is right to do is to try to stop people from making that decision. Uh, so so the, there's a moral way. issue there which emerges. Yeah. Okay, and then, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, Peter D. Williams, Right to Life. Um, so clearly there are a narrow number of people who do suffer this existential pain as opposed to physical pain and who want to die because of that. But aren't there also another constituency of people who would be pressured into death where they feel they have a duty to die for whatever reason? What safeguards, I would like to ask the two uh, proponents of assisted suicide, what real safeguards could be put into place to stop that? Because after all, I mean, we, you asked for statistics. Uh, one fact which uh, um, Ray Tass did not actually give is that one of the reasons why people give uh, they want to die in the dignity, uh, death of Dignity Act reports from Oregon is um, that they want they feel they're a burden on their families. In 1998, when the first report came out, that was 13 percent. The last year, it was 57.1 percent. So I wonder, you know, what we say about those people. That, that's the proportion of people who say they're who doing they're it for doing other it people because they want to because they feel that they want to be a burden on their okay. families. Great. Um, also, just one final final thing, uh, Ray, uh, could you just uh, could you clarify? You made a distinction between assisted dying and assisted suicide. It didn't seem to me there was a meaningful distinction between those, and it would be very nice if you could uh, just clarify that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all for those uh, uh, questions. Kevin, do you want to do, do you want to respond uh, first to? Yeah. I think the first point was put directly to you. And any other anything else you want to pick up on? If you could reasonably briefly, we'll have another round of questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, just to say that, that I actually disagree with Ray. I do support free speech even if I disagree with it. I think that's one of the, one of the aspects of free speech that, that is important is that it's not simply speech that we agree with. It's a little bit like uh, Justice Rehnquist said uh, when asked for a definition of pornography. He said, I know it when I see it. Um, I don't think that's good enough. I think we have to have that. Anyway, um, that different argument altogether. Different, yeah, we'll have yes. a different debate. D different debate. Some other time, yeah. 
Um, just on the first question, Jan, uh, are there other arguments? Well, yes. Yes, there are many different arguments. Uh, this is one of the reasons I wrote this book, is, is to, to, uh, to delineate them. One of them that strikes me as important is the breach of privacy of the deathbed scene. Um, as somebody who is, not, who is an atheist, I don't want to throw out the priest from the deathbed scene and bring um, lawyers to make sure that the entire process has, has uh, occurred on, on, a, on the right basis. I, I think this is a bureaucratization of death. I think it's, it's turning death in, into something that it doesn't need to be. Um, and I think uh, the privacy aspect is something that I think is very, very interesting. It's an implication. If you shine a legal spotlight on the deathbed scene, first of all, doctors, are, um, according to the, the, the bill that's being proposed, can face up to five years in prison for losing the paperwork. Um, and so doctors are going to have to be watching after their, you, you know, right now doctors take courageous decisions, in my view, um, under the radar in it, about 3,000 times per year if, uh, to look at the statistics. And I think that's a good thing. I think doctors should be able to do that. And the more they're scrutinized, the less they are going to do that. Uh, and the more they're going to sit there with the paperwork, go through the 14 days, uh, as Ray outlined, and, and Leslie outlined. Um, and I think, you know, when this kind of action needs to be taken, I think it should be done unofficially with no change in the law. So that's one other argument. There are others. You have to buy my book when it gets cheaper because it's just too expensive now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Not, again, another discussion. He's a mass murderer. That's slightly different than most GPs in, in Britain, which I'm, I'm pleased to say. Um, Bob, uh, I think the, the issue of suffering, I think, I think you know, I can't disagree with, with uh, very much you've said, although I would say, I'd underline the point that Ray made, which is this is not about pain. The top three, even the top five reasons why people in Oregon take their lives is not to do with pain. It's an existential problem, and uh, I think uh, that's the one that I don't think a law can meaningfully address. I don't think you can, you, you can define suffering in saying, this person is suffering over here, this person's not suffering. Uh, it has to, it's a subjective kind of thing. And I don't think you can set the law and say, people in this category, definitely suffering. Over here, sorry, your suffering isn't good enough. And that's specifically what this law will do. OK, uh, Ray. Um, first of all, just picking up the Oregon data, Individuals who sought assisted dying had several reasons. The, uh, but we're talking in the upper 90s for the reasons that I've given. Those who cited burden of family had other more pressing reasons. So it wasn't the sole reason for seeking assisted dying. Um, it's not entirely dishonorable to worry about others as well, but that wasn't the primary reason. <clears throat> Secondly, Kevin's worried about lawyers. But I, guess, I guess, by the way, that there may be a connection between the point that was made about the impact, you know, about the impact on carers and the decision not to want other people to go through something might also be to do with not wanting to be remembered for being in that state. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting an argument here, but I'm just connecting points that have been made, I guess. And I think that's a very good connection because I think the point you made is one remembers a loved one possibly through the lens of a, a month of terrible experience that both of you went through together, which is not the right, as it were, lens to look at somebody. The, the lawyer issue, Kevin, lawyers at the moment are deeply involved with any kind of assistance to die. That at the moment, if somebody, an amateur, in inverted commas, assists somebody to die, it will be referred to the direct public prosecutions. And the first thing that will happen is the police will make a visit. And I would recommend you read Chris Broad's account of his wife Michelle's death. She'd left some lovely notes for the family and so on. But needless to say, when she died, in came the policeman, kicked down the door, terribly tactful, took all the notes away, there were evidence and so on. So the law is an absolute beast at the moment surrounding people who have any kind of assistance to die. When it comes to I'm the kind of situation I'm envisaging, the, 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 lawyers, the lawyers won't be sitting around the bedside. They will maybe be present to look at any kind of document that is produced in the, in, in, in the first instance. They will provide a kind of safeguard, but they're not there by the bedside. And by the way, when you make a decision that you want to die, it doesn't mean to say that you've got to, as it were, cash the prescription within 14 days or whatever. Many people will bank a prescription and not use it. Many of them will uh, certainly get a prescription or 
have all the paperwork done um, well in advance of the time when they need to use it. The 14-day interval is in Lord Faulkner's bill, but if someone is expected to die within a month, that's reduced to six days. That's the kind of balance of, of, of safeguards. As always, you've got to have a strike of balance. Sorry. Leslie. I'd just like to talk about this idea of the privacy of death, because the majority of people die in hospital these days, which is not a very private setting. I believe that if the law were changed so that people could ask for an assisted death, more people would be able to die at home mm. in the privacy of their own house and with their own family around them, and fewer of those beeping machines and all the other things that make death less, death less private. I also worry about Kevin's phrase that doctors are acting courageously by taking decisions under the radar. In other words, they're acting illegally. I, I think that's, that's not the way to go. I think we need to have greater clarity and transparency in this. Kevin, it is two against one up here, so let me allow you to come back. <laughs> Okay, I don't, I don't see the problem of doctors taking that action. I think what happens, that the, the prosecutions that I've seen, for, for instance, Dr. Michael Irwin is one of the prosecutions, but Dr. Michael Irwin does everything but run past a police station naked, giving a V sign and saying, arrest me, please. That's, that's, doctor, that's the kind of situation that tends to be prosecuted. In situations, in most of the, the big situations, there's another case in, in New Zealand that I know about, and the only reason that the police were involved is because the person who accomplished the act went and told a lot of, uh, went and reported himself to the police. Um, I think in most of these instances, there's not going to be anybody objecting. Um, the family, I, certainly in my experience, when I had an elderly relative die, uh, it, there was, uh, the doctor came and said, this is the course of action that I recommend. And um, we said, yes, we think that's absolutely right. The family voted, in fact, um, as I recall, my mother being, being a great Democrat and issues like that. Uh, and I think these kind of situations happen about, as I say, 3,000 times a year. That's not that many. They're getting less and less because uh, palliative care is improving all of the time. And as Ray talked about, the terminal sedation is usually is often used. Um, and so there, there are fewer and fewer of these kind of cases coming up, and I just don't see that that necessitates a change in the law. Um, Actually, you have no data to support that longitudinal trend. You've just invented that to support your case. We do not are have... Are you saying there are more? We, we, we have... I'm talking about the, the, the quality of death. We do, we've done a review of bad deaths, and the data are very poor. We have plenty of anecdotal data of large numbers of our deaths, but we have very little in the way of genuine quantitative data of what proportion of people have bad deaths, and we have even less data about longitudinal trends. So you can't say that there are fewer and fewer people who may require assisted dying. We just don't have the data, unless they've come to you in a flaming pie from heaven. Finally. Well, Ray, I can take your own book. Uh, as being a, a, a very good statistic that you use, uh, which I can't, I, I can't recall, but you will agree with it because you wrote it, um, which is that people dying bad deaths tend to die bad deaths at a particular age, um, in between uh, 60, uh, around that period of time. That's what I recall you, you saying. Okay, um, I, won't, I won't push the point since I'm on, on your territory with your book at the moment, but I, are you telling me that more deaths are occurring that are bad deaths, and how are you defining bad deaths? I mean, that's, that's a very no, subjective all, kind all of thing. All I'm saying is you have thing. no longitudinal data to support your you. assertion that, exactly, it's, but I wasn't making longitudinal assertions. So let's call but the point up. remains is there is a rather large number of people, and we have not only individuals who've described, and we, often the patient's voice is squashed out in these abstract arguments, but large numbers of individuals who have had these experiences. And the more, the more honest of palliative care physicians will indicate that it is not uncommon to have this kind of uh, very bad death. And we are talking about probably perhaps 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 out of the 500,000 deaths, but still a very important number. And of course, many more will benefit from knowing that they won't necessarily have to face a bad death if it comes to that, if there's a law to help them. So, uh, thank you all. Uh, there's a lot of hands, but you know, we could take a rushed other round and a rushed other round from the panel, but I don't think, the, it, it's not, I don't think that's the, the best way to finish the conversation. I think we've heard a lot of good arguments in the, uh, the, the, the panel. We've heard actually a lot of good arguments from uh, the floor. There are two books outside which express oppo opposing uh, views uh, on this. What was the book that you were referring to, Ray's book? 
Yes, I didn't recognize the date. It was called uh, Reflections of Metaphysical Flaneur, and it's got an essay called uh, The Case for Sister Dying, which actually appears in Leslie's book as well. And I think what Kevin was confusing was the fact that certainly... No, I just want to know the name of the book. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I just want to know the name of the book. Thank you. It's just you haven't got a book outside, so no, I'm, just trying to be, I'm just trying to be I fair to you, right? Okay, so that's available on all good websites, I'm sure. Absolutely, right, yes, okay. Yes, so, yes. Um, uh, th thank you all for coming. Thank you all for participating in the debate in, in, in the right spirit. And as I say, I think the, one of the really important things in this debate is that we at least agree what we disagree about, and I think our panel have helped us to do that. So can I ask you to join me in thanking you?